Hey there, ghoulies. Welcome back to another mini-sode of Clever Ghouls. I'm Megan, and today we're gonna be talking about a pretty heavy topic, the glorification of serial killers. We're gonna get pretty deep into some of the evolutionary psychology of morbid curiosity, humans' predator-prey relationship, some of the racial implications of true crime, and reasons why true crime as entertainment is pretty problematic. Usually, mini-sodes are quick and fairly light, but today's is gonna be a little bit longer than some of my usual ones and come with a few content warnings, but stick with me if you can because the subject is incredibly important. Some content warnings to be mindful of though are obviously discussions of murder and serial killers but also child murder specifically in this episode and racism. Hollywood has a long history of glorifying serial killers in its films. From the classic horror movies to modern psychological thrillers of today, serial killers have been given the glamorized larger-than-life treatment on the silver screen. This glorification of serial killers has been criticized by some for humanizing what are in reality some of the most heinous and morally reprehensible acts imaginable. This kind of characterization of serial killers is incredibly dangerous as it can lead to a desensitization of the brutality and terror associated with these kinds of crime. And this glamorization of serial killers can have dangerous effects on viewers too. By portraying these criminals in a sympathetic light, movies can make them seem more attractive and appealing, leading an impressionable viewer to become fixated on them. Furthermore, the focus on the art of a killer's crimes can lead viewers to idealize their actions, creating a really dangerous idolization of the criminals and what they do. But before we dive deeper into some of the implications of the glorification of serial killers, I really want to talk about some of the psychology behind morbid curiosity and people's fascination with the macabre. In particular, their fascination with serial killers. Society's obsession with killers largely stems from our fascination with dangerous situations, and this stems from our evolutionary relationship with predators. As humans, we are both predator and prey, and it was much more necessary for us to know how to effectively navigate not becoming prey in our earlier years than it really is now. And predators aren't always hunting, right? So it was in the prey's best interest to be able to identify when a predator is hunting because running from a predator requires an immense amount of energy. So from a distance, prey would observe a predator to learn how it looks, how it behaves, and what its current motivational state is. This behavior is called predator inspection. Threats to survival from predators and hostile conspecifics have led all species to possess cognitive architecture for predator management. Our minds deal with dangerous people really similar to how they do other dangerous predators. We try to learn about them when it's safe to do so because this helps us to know how to more effectively avoid them. And as humans, we have a pretty unique skill that allows us to do this without being immediately in the presence of danger or a predator, or in this example, a killer. We have the ability for what's called mental simulation, which is just a fancy term for our imagination. We're able to come up with these imaginary and hypothetical situations in our minds to play out different scenarios. The proceed learning benefit is high while the cost and risk of this learning is incredibly low. So we have this evolutionarily ingrained desire to want to evade harm, but again, why the fascination with serial killers in society? We're gonna get into the harm of how this fascination often snowballs and dives into glorification and idolization shortly, but on the surface level of things, it stems from a sense of morbid curiosity. Psychologically speaking, morbid curiosity is the motivation to learn about potential threats. Like many aspects of human psychology, that seems too obvious to require a definition and rigorous scientific explanation, and curiosity largely has been really difficult to define and explain. Some of the first thoughts on trying to define curiosity can be traced back to William James, but he really didn't dig too deep into the subject and he did not offer empirical evidence for his concept. And more recently in 2020, Doobie and Griffiths have posited that the function of curiosity is to increase the usefulness of one's own knowledge through information gathering. When an organism is faced with a new stimulus, it should investigate the situation only if that stimulus is likely to occur again. But while Doobie and Griffiths provide an integrative and functional explanation of curiosity, a discussion about the role of evolved predispositions is absent. As an example, most of us are not really prey to snakes. However, most humans still display an information gathering bias towards them, likely due to our previous evolutionary relationship with them. So again, stay with me here. Let's put everything that we've learned together so far. Morbid curiosity is born out of a need to detect and deal with threats, aka threat management and it's powered by motivation to gather information, aka curiosity, and the ability to mentally simulate potential threats, aka imagination. This all together kind of serves as an explanation as to why society has this fascination with serial killers, and on some levels, morbid curiosity and education is healthy. It's when it crosses boundaries into entertainment and glamorization that it becomes wholly problematic. 
An example of healthy morbid curiosity turned in entertainment is in the rise of popularity of the 2011 film Contagion during the 2020 lockdowns due to the coronavirus. This film went from being hardly really remembered to the second most watched Warner Brothers film during this time. A closer look at how the human mind deals with potentially dangerous information may help answer the question of why some people sought out pathogen-related entertainment in the wake of a real pathogenic threat. The human brain is sourcing material to make sense of a perceived threat and trying to create a plan for safety. All right, so now on to the actual topic at hand here. Viewed through the lens of an evolutionary psychologist, this interest in horrific events such as serial killing may be a product of protective vigilance, but constantly and lately at an exponential rate, this morbid curiosity has barreled into an unhealthy fascination that is fueled by glorification and serves to entertain and not educate. Hollywood's glorification of serial killers is a dangerous phenomenon that has serious implications in the real world. It anesthetizes viewers to the brutality of these kinds of crimes and leads to some romanticizing of the killers themselves and even leads to a false sense of justification of the killer's actions. The release of Monster, the Jeffrey Dahmer story in 2022 ignited a necessary discourse about the media's constant fetishizing of crime and serial killers such as Dahmer himself. This conversation also opened up previously in 2019 with the Ted Bundy film, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil, and Vile. Viewers watched and sympathized with Bundy, leaned into his old nickname of Handsome Ted as they found him attractive, and cracked jokes about how they'd let him murder them any day. But Ted Bundy raped, kidnapped, and murdered young women and girls throughout 1974 to 1978, as far as we know. He confessed to at least 30 murders, and like Dahmer, Bundy was considered to be extremely attractive by the masses. During Bundy's trial, a group of fans that supported Bundy and advocated for his innocence, also known as Bundy Files, said that they just couldn't picture him carrying out such brutal crimes as a result of his handsome looks. Dahmer, however, posed a slightly different problem and one that is honestly possibly even more disturbing. This show is a 10-part series with each episode digging into graphic detail on the way that he murdered his victims. One episode for each victim, a retelling that Netflix for some reason deemed deserving of mass viewing. This show, and others like it, is predicated on recreating creating the most traumatic and final moments of a real person's life in explicit detail. This series literally takes the stories of how real people died and emulated them to make millions and millions of dollars. And they do this by focusing on the killers and their stories themselves and not centering the victims. And I frequently hear retorts of people trying to justify this particular realm of media by saying that it one, raises awareness, and two, allows us to understand the mind of these killers. But let's be honest here, the average person really doesn't need to do either of these things. We are already aware of these atrocities. They happen around us every day. And furthermore, these pieces of media are created to entertain us and not educate us. They don't center the victims and almost no one watching these videos takes the time to research the victims or the situations themselves. And there really isn't a need for the average person to understand the intricacies and the nuance of the mind of a killer. That's what we have psychologists, psychiatrists, and behavior experts for. It's also imperative to acknowledge the effects that these shows and movies had and still have on the victims' families. The mother of one of Dahmer's victims has spoken out many times against Netflix's most recent series, pointing out the inaccuracies of the plot. Writers and directors just didn't feel the need to utilize the families as consultants on these projects as the cases are public record. The media spends so much time focused on telling the backstory of these killers that we just entirely forget they really had victims altogether. Real life people, some of them children. Dahmer's youngest victim was 14 years old and Bundy's was 12, but can you name any of them? Can you name any of Bundy's victims? How about Dahmer's? Something else that makes the shows and movies problematic is that the media has moved away more and more from being actual documentaries to being biopics. This further conflates the lines between reality and fiction, and it allows viewers to fawn over their favorite actors and indulge in a Hollywood glamour-directed tale solely meant to entertain us. And while Dahmer is no longer alive, he and his atrocious acts have been immortalized through over 20 pieces of popular media created about him. His name will be immortal due to shows like this Netflix series, which soon after its debut in September became Netflix's most popular English series ever, trailing only slightly behind the fourth season of Stranger Things. This show was a staggering $300 million deal. And this problem continues to dig even deeper as Dahmer's victim was a black gay man. Far too often, our media is trauma porn based on the trials and struggles of marginalized people. And reactions on social media and true crime podcasts, all commentary largely provided by white women, were that they just didn't understand the backlash because they really had no problems digesting this graphic content. But honestly, this is because they had no stake in the murders, because it's not happening to people like them in the same manner. They were able to watch this show without fear because Dahmer never would have 
victimize them. According to a 1990 report from the U.S. Department of Justice and the Office of Justice Programs, 17% of serial killers were black. So, by that logic, at least 15% of our media surrounding telling the stories of and getting into the minds of serial killers should be about black people too, right? However, that's just for some reason not the case. But why is that? In a world where black and brown people are constantly vilified by our justice system and media at exponentially growing rates, why are there no documentaries about them? All signs point to it being because black men just don't fit the media's idealized profile. This doesn't afford Netflix or other production companies the chance to cast one of their many affluent white heart to capitalize on. Perhaps because even in 2023, whiteness still equals goodness in the eyes of society. And when it doesn't, we need to know why. All of these white male killers are bestowed the luxury of psychoanalysis. We're allowed an insight into why they become the way that they are, the multiple facets of their personality, their tragic backstories, and why we should see them as humans who just simply took the wrong path. But the uncomfortable truth here is, in serial killer documentaries and film and fiction and true crime, black and brown perpetrators are still not allowed to take center stage. In art, just as in life, BIPOC are underrepresented. Through the absence of an extravagant Hollywood depiction, we never get to learn what makes them human too or why they did what they did. They're simply tossed into a nameless pile of grisly statistics. And don't get me wrong, while the glorification of serial killers must not be the modus operandi, black or white, the imbalance in our media storytelling does not go unnoticed. When a handsome white man commits these unthinkable acts, they still somehow end up with a fan base that excuses their behavior and idolizes them, making excuses for their behavior because of a hardship that they encountered. But when a black man does it, he's immediately deemed as a thug. There is a perversivity that comes with the examination of true crime and serial killers in particular. Yes, these stories often end with a comeuppance that involves a guilty criminal being sentenced to prison. But before they get what they deserve, there has to be an exploration into all those needless killings, sexual assaults, and deeply deplorable acts before you reach that justice. True crime, more than any other genre, has a line of ethicality that should not be crossed. Even so, with a quick online search, it's easy to find groups of people who disregard this line altogether. I saw this personally a lot when I was active in Facebook groups for the podcast My Favorite Murder. I stopped listening to the podcast itself very early on because it crossed a lot of lines for me that I just couldn't support. But I stayed in these groups because I had formed friendships and communities there. But ultimately, it just got really disheartening and exhausting to watch those same lines get crossed over over and over in these groups too. The internet is a weird and wonderful place that allows people from all over the world and all different walks of life to come together over even the most niche of interest. But unfortunately, these interests can frequently do more harm than good, especially when these intense fandoms form around them. And there's something especially off-putting about forming a fandom around murder. When searching for a resource to back up a statistic that I mentioned earlier in this minisode, I came across an article titled Nine Serial Killers Who We Would Want to Slice Us Open which I will not be linking for obvious reasons. This article completely disregards the fate of the victims of these killers, yet takes the time to outline all of the atrocities and actions that had taken place while simultaneously making sexual puns about the killers themselves. This just further proves my previous point that far too often people are into true crime not for education or awareness, but because the focus is never on how terrible these acts were or centering the victims. They focus on the tragic backstory of the killer and how handsome they were, thus glorifying the killer. While these stories detail what happened and talk about the victims, they are never centered around them and instead continue to highlight the murderer. The commercialization and exploitation of murdered humans is both unethical and callous. These movies and shows do nothing to honor the lives of the victims, but instead create a piece of entertainment. When people think about those like Dahmer and Bundy, they don't remember the horrors of their actions, but they remember these pieces of media based largely around sensationalized fiction and constantly re-traumatizing the families of these victims with unnecessary and frequently inaccurate retellings just continues pushing them further away from the closure that they desperately deserve. This minisode honestly could go on forever because there is so much to unpack and discuss with this topic, but I'm gonna cut it here for now. There is an immense amount of research on this topic and I will link some of it in the show notes for you. I know this is kind of a tough topic to digest, so thank you for sticking with me and I hope you learned something and I can't wait to chat with y'all again soon. Stay creepy. The Clever Cools podcast is run by Megan, Marissa, Blair, and Melissa. This episode was done by Megan. Our intro and outro music was created for us by Josh Marshall. Find his links on our show notes. For more episodes, expanded show notes, and other spooky content, find us on your favorite social media platform through our handle at Clever Don't forget to subscribe and share. And if you really like our content, please leave us a review. 